Good afternoon, uh, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Julio Godinez, and welcome to today's Container Journal webinar, Kubernetes Guardrails and Governance, brought to you by Fairwinds. We have a great webinar for you today, but before we get started, I need to go through some housekeeping announcements. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any of the webinars, you will be able to watch it again. We will be sending a link out to access the webinar on demand, or you can visit containerjournal.com slash webinars, and it will be available to you. We are taking questions from the audience, audience throughout the presentation. Use your webinar interface to submit questions in the Q&A section. We'll try to get to as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Uh, we, we also have uh, polling questions during today's event, so we'd appreciate if you take a couple of seconds to submit your answers when you see them come up on your screen. Finally, stick around until the end because we are uh, we are doing a drawing for four twenty-five dollar Amazon gift cards. So stay tuned to see if you're a winner. Joining me today is Kendall Miller, president at Fairwinds, Robert Brennan, director at Open Source, uh, director of Open Source at Fairwinds, Andy Suderman, director of R and D and technology at Fairwinds, and Aaron Friel, senior software engineer at Two Chair. And with that, I'm going to put myself on mute turn off my camera and let you get to it. All right, thanks Julio. Well, welcome folks. Um, this is the panel discussing Kubernetes guardrails and governance. Um, I'm Kendall Miller, uh, glad to have you here. This is going to be more of a panel and less slide heavy than other webinars uh, that we have done with devops.com. So my screen will not be in screen sharing mode the entire time. Um, and the webinar keeps kicking me off of screen sharing like it did just now, so that's uh, that's probably good. Um, anyways, and it's, <laughs> I have no idea what's happening, uh, but uh, I'm not I'm I'm not literally not touching anything, so it's kind of exciting. Um, we will figure out the technology and uh, navigate it despite ourselves. So before we dive in, um, we we had a brief introduction already, but real quick, we're, we'll give a little bit more in depth discussion of of who we are. So my name's Kendall. Uh, I've been at Fairwinds for a while. We'll tell you about Fairwinds in just a second. Um, I've been here six years and the company has been heavily focused on Kubernetes for the vast majority of that time. So I talked to lots and lots of companies about Kubernetes, how they're using it, what they're doing with it, what their needs are, et cetera. Uh, I've been working in this space for a long time and I'm excited to be here and be moderating uh, this panel. And um, let's go over to Andy next to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Andy, Director of R&D and Technology for, at Fairwinds. Kendall's actually one of the people who recruited me. I've been working in Kubernetes for uh, about five years. I've been with this company for about three and a half. And I'm uh, just in general excited about all things Kubernetes, quite frankly. Uh, so, Great. Thanks, Andy. And Robert, you want to go next? Yeah, I'm Robert Brennan. I'm Director of Open Source Software here at Fairwinds. Um, I've been uh, building software for over a decade now, working with Kubernetes for about three years, and I've been with Fairwinds for most of that time. Um, so super excited to, to talk about policy and governance today. Excellent. Thank you. And then, uh, you know, no panel is complete without somebody on the outside who has absolutely none of the same objectives as our internal company people. So that's why we've asked Aaron to be here to give us another perspective. We're really glad you're here, Aaron. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Kendall. Yeah, I'm a senior engineer at Two Chairs. It's a behavioral health company in the Bay Area. And uh, I have about four or five years of experience in Kubernetes on the three cloud platforms um, and uh, have been principal uh, in moving our system to Kubernetes and running and operating it securely and safely. So this is a very pertinent topic for me to, to, to be here to talk about today. All right, yeah, and we're glad you're here. And uh, uh, if if I remember right, everyone calls you Freel. I've called you Aaron at least twice in this. I fully intend to switch back and forth in uh, no coherent manner. So, um, <laughs> I appreciate your recall there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> glad to have you here. Okay, so real quick. Oh my goodness, what what is happening to my uh, technology right now? This is. Uh, all of a sudden, that slide gets to a weird size. So here, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to fix this real quick, stop sharing. But real quick, Fairwinds uh, is a, stop sharing, yes. Um, Fairwinds is a Kubernetes company. We've been in business for a long time, doing all the Kubernetes things. Uh, we started as a services org for those companies that come and say, make my infrastructure problem go away. We will build and maintain infrastructure for people. 
that's all Kubernetes based. We don't do it if it's not Kubernetes. Um, as a result of building and running lots and lots of infrastructure over many years, uh, we have seen some of the sort of macro level problems that people have in running Kubernetes and we write open source projects to address those needs. So we have tools out there like Polaris that does configuration validation, RBAC manager for managing RBAC, Goldilocks gets your resource requests just right. We have all kinds of other things. Um, and then recently, the last couple of years, we have built a SaaS platform above and beyond that, that marries together a lot of our open source, as well as third party open source to do configuration validation, security policy governance and guardrails, hence the topic today. It happens to be relevant to what we do. Uh, and that is what our software platform does in Kubernetes. Um, stick around at the end of this, I will be giving a very brief five minute uh, demo of the software, assuming that screen sharing works, which uh, I think we'll figure out in one way or another by then. But uh, that's who Fairwinds is. And that's why we're here talking about this today is because this is what we do as a company is think about guardrails. We think about policy. We think about governance. And um, there's probably something that we have out there, software, uh, SaaS paid or um open source that is relevant to you if you're using Kubernetes today. And of course, we also still have that service if you need to come say, make my infrastructure problem go away. Um, so before we dive in, we do have a polling question. Uh, and Julio, if you want to pull that poll up, um, let's see if I have it or whoever's running polls. Where are you in your Kubernetes journey? I think I can hit this button. There we go. So you should have a poll on your screen. Spend a minute, fill that out. That gives us a feeling for where our audience is. And then it gives me a second to stop talking and try to figure out how to make slides work the way I expect them to. We've got a few people. Please poll, answer the question. Yeah, it's coming in. Here we go. And hey, oh, there we go. Look at that. Exactly how it's supposed to be working. So you can't answer on the slide, you gotta answer off on the side. We've got uh, a number of responses in, but I know there's a lot more of you there. So chime in uh, and tell us who you are. Kendall, I have to say, you know, this was a tough one for me to answer because uh, I feel like I'm always learning about containers and Kubernetes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can't give that diplomatic of an answer here. Uh, for yeah. Come on. Um, uh, yeah, you're right. Even, even when you're mature along the path, there's going to be some learning there. Is that what you're arguing? Yeah. You know, um, I think the more you learn about the stack and how it's all connected, the more you learn of how deep it goes, right? And from uh, kernel, kernel and operating systems level all the way up to that wonderful ideal of a perfect distributed system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little like a foreign language. You, you, you learn pods and nodes and how to kube control into a few things and think you've got there. And then uh, the more you learn, you realize how much higher the peak is than you thought. Um, mm -hmm. here, we'll give this five more seconds and then we'll close up the polls. So get in your answers while you can, but you're right, for real. I think I would I would change that slightly to say the more you learn, the more you learn you don't know. Uh, it really. really does. It's it's even worse than learning a language because it just goes so much deeper and broader uh, as you keep going. In my opinion, yeah. Fortunately, they're not releasing new versions of you know English every few months. Um, usually, it's once a, a generation or so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. There's an awful lot of words out there that I don't understand anymore. It sure feels <laughs> that's, that way. That's true. <laughs> Okay, we're going to close this up and uh, read back some of these responses for y'all just so you know. So we've got 32% um, of the people here are saying they're just learning about Kubernetes and containers. 16% are saying planning to use in the next 6 to 12 months. Uh, only 4% saying using it and testing in a development environment. 44, the largest, largest crowd, is saying I'm using it in production and 4% say they have no plans to use it. So if you have no plans to use Kubernetes, this panel may not be the most relevant for you. <laughs> uh, just fair warning. Uh, now, maybe you're here because you want to know if you should have plans, and we will we will dive into that. But uh, all right. Now I'm going to turn my screen sharing back off so that we can see beautiful faces while we talk. And um, let's go ahead and dive in. So... Um, Andy, I'm going to ask you to represent the services side of the organization and Robert, the software side of our organization. But let's start with Aaron and tell us about 
your current Kubernetes setup, what you're currently doing, what does the environment look like, et cetera, so that people have a feeling for what, what kind of world you're living in. Yeah, um, when I joined Two Chairs, uh, we inherited a system that was sort of like on a, a Heroku-like uh, HIPAA compliant container platform. Um, not gonna name names or, or anything like that, but there was a real impetus, I think, to move off of uh, that environment um, for a number of reasons. One was being able to run bespoke software to be able to like set up that perimeter uh, for our network and be able to control what we're running uh, more concretely. And I think also to grow, to expand to, you know, one of the big cloud provider services, um, which we were kind of isolated from in that environment. Um, so over the past three years, uh, we've been running Kubernetes in production, uh, running our entire stack on it. Uh, we migrated over from our existing system over to that one, and it was actually a remarkably smooth migration. Um, and I credit that to the depth of tooling out there to respond to like uh, the creation of resources calling out things like cert manager um, and external DNS and all those wonderful tools that uh, essentially automate uh, a lot of the mundane tasks that you have to do to run a system in production and keep it running. Um, I'm sure we're all intimately familiar with. Oh, but wait, Aaron, can't I yeah. just click button, get Kubernetes and everything's going to work just fine? What do you mean all these other tools and depth of uh, ecosystem? Because that sounds terrifying. It, you know, uh, and I think what it is for me is I like that Kubernetes specifies in sort of a central place a description of everything that are run that we're running. Um, I think that uh, the major cloud providers, whether it's uh, Azure with their resource manager templates or CloudFormation on AWS, um, I believe they have a new tool on Google Cloud that does something similar, allows you to declaratively specify what you're pushing out onto their platform. Um, but Kubernetes really embodies that to every level. And it gives me the ability to see what exactly we're doing with our system. Um, that visibility comes with the trade-off of, yeah, it's kind of, it can be kind of overwhelming at first. Um, but then there's all these wonderful open source tools. I mentioned a couple um, that help automate, again, those mundane tasks of setting up DNS or certificates and making sure that you're running things uh, in a secure way. And, and real quick, uh, in currently just describing your current setup, you have one cluster running, you have 150 clusters running. Uh, just give us some sense of what scale looks and feels like. Yeah, uh, we're running a cluster per environment. So we have a production cluster, we have a, a staging environment cluster, and we have a, a review app cluster, um, which our developer environments are are hosted on. Um, one of the, the blissful benefits of Kubernetes is being able to uh, give essentially each engineer or even each branch that an engineer is working on their own isolated space to push some code up test it, validate it, um, and then merge that into our mainline branch and deploy it out to production. And and that their own environment, you uh, separate entirely by their own VPC or, I mean, namespace. What do you, what do you, when you say, just, just yeah. clarify for people. You talk yeah, it's, yeah, and I think that, you know, we're a startup and we're an engineering team of now just about 12 uh, engineers. Um, so we're a pretty small company, I think, in, in the space. Um, and it would be cost prohibitive for us to do something like what we're doing with review apps, uh, being able to push up per branch environments on anything except Kubernetes. Um, just the sheer cost, like if we forget about a branch that we've deployed, it's a fixed cost to us to run the cluster, the number of nodes that we have. Um, we do have auto scaling set up, but you know, it's you know three to five nodes or something to run all of the review apps that we have. And uh, we're not paying per unit of CPU time or memory um, in the same way that we would on a uh, platform as a service uh, offering. Great. Yeah, that's actually, we did, we did, we just slip in a Kubernetes pitch there. <laughs> um, Andy, you want to go next? Tell us about uh, the kinds of setups we do and the kinds of clients we're serving and what scale looks like. So people have a feeling for some of the, the, the perspective we bring in. Sure. Yeah. So on the services side of Fairwinds, we run, um, well, we've over my time here, we've run hundreds of different clusters ranging from five nodes to several hundred nodes across all three major cloud providers, Azure, GCP, and AWS. Uh, we've run COPS clusters, EKS clusters, AKS clusters, and GKE clusters primarily. Um, and uh, our customers range from, you know, uh, private APIs that are just B2B to large uh, customer facing organizations with thousands of customers um, that uh, hit their site every 
few minutes. Uh, so it's it's been quite the range of different things. And so the our biggest challenges are really um, coming up with uh, infrastructure setups that work well across all these different customers. And so you, the, Fraley, you actually mentioned a couple of things that we use, and I'm, I'm sure it's not surprising to anybody, but I call it the trifecta. It's Nginx, Ingress, External DNS, and Cert Manager, because those three things together enable a developer to expose a new application or an API to the world with with security and DNS or TLS and DNS automatically. Um, and so that's kind of our focus is really just what can we run across all of our customers and how can we do that in a way that's repeatable and stable? So we're, we're never on the cutting edge of anything. We're always you know just below the cutting edge and minus one or two on Kubernetes versions and things like that because we're really focused on what works across all these different ranges of environments. Well, and and just for clarity, for the sake of the audience, our engineers run Pager on every single one of our clients' infrastructures. And the only way that that is even remotely feasible <laughs> is that we're really good at this. And so we can build it in a way it's not gonna go down all the time. And part of that means we don't wanna be bleeding edge all the time. Yep. Uh, anyways, um, Robert, do you wanna go ahead and introduce uh, what your team looks like and how it interacts with Kubernetes? Yeah, so uh, I came into Fairwinds a few years ago once we already kind of established ourselves as a Kubernetes services organization to found the um, the first software engineering team here. Um, and that was really fortunate because we had this incredible team of SREs who basically set us up with, you know, enterprise level infrastructure on day one. Um, so on day one, we had, um, like Phil was talking about earlier, uh, we had separate staging and production environments. We had review apps for every single uh, branch that we pushed. Um, and it's, uh, it's great. Like Phil said, it's, it's much easier to manage all those different review environments, um, uh, within Kubernetes rather than having to spin up a new EC2 instance every time you want to, uh, review something. Um, so we, we love that aspect of it. Um, we really manage the application side of things. So we, we rely on, um, an internal SRE team. We basically are, um, you know, treated as an external customer, even though we're an internal team. Um, so we utilize a team of SREs to manage um, all that underlying infrastructure, like Andy was talking about, external DNS and ingress and certificate management and all the stuff that we don't really want to think about as application developers. And then we have um, uh, a couple of Helm charts for deploying our applications uh, into the cluster, um, which uh, which we manage ourselves as a team. We manage our own CSCD pipeline. Um, and basically, you know, uh, we have a... Um, a staging deployment that's long lived, a production deployment that's obviously long lived, and um, we have review apps that get cut for every single branch, um, and uh, it's it's just a really seamless process that the SRT, SRE team has set us up with. Great. So let's now that we have some context on where we're approaching this conversation from, let's talk like dive right into some of the. What are the pitfalls you've run into? What are some of the biggest issues you've seen with Kubernetes? And, uh, you know, I, I, I remember all the way back to when we were first getting started and we were using uh, the Weave CNI and we, and we started to run into some really weird problems and we're like, hey, maybe it's time to change our network overlay because everything's a disaster. And uh, the amount of pain that it saved us just to change to a different tool in that space was enormous. But like, that was a long time ago problem that most people probably aren't dealing with anymore and their Kubernetes providers probably dealing with for them. But, um, you know, I don't know who, who wants to start with that. You probably all have war wounds. Go for it, Andy. I, I feel like I've been saying this a lot lately, but nine times out of 10, when our customers have an issue with their cluster, um, you know, by default, we run it, we we strongly encourage running HPA and uh, horizontal pod autoscaler, and we strongly we always enable cluster autoscaling, and those things are great and they work really well with the scheduler, but they only work well if you set your resource requests and limits properly, um, and and actually really just set them in the first place and then set them properly. Um, but I, I gotta say, like nine times out of ten, it's resource contention that is caused by some misconfiguration somewhere as far as resource requests and limits go. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. In general, I would say Kubernetes is such a, it's such a powerful platform. It can, it can serve any real use case. It's meant to be kind of everything to everyone. 
And um, that makes it really complex to set up properly. There's a lot of configuration options. You know, uh, a lot of them are optional, even though they, they probably shouldn't be. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you really should be doing that Kubernetes will happily allow you to not do. Setting resource requests and limits is one. Setting liveness and readiness probes is another. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do to, to help Kubernetes understand if your application is healthy, how it should scale up and down, uh, whether it's behaving, you know, in a, in a reasonable way. Um, and uh, if you don't do those things, if you don't kind of give Kubernetes hints as to, to you know, know what your application is up to, then um, it can end up doing some crazy things and taking down your application or um, leading to huge cost overruns because it tried to scale up your app, you know, way over what you actually wanted. Um, there's just a, there's a handful of best practices that I think everybody should be following. And it's just so easy as, you know, coming at it from the development side, um, you know, if my application is running and I can access it at the, you know, at the, at the host name that I specified, I don't really think about it beyond that, even though, you know, there might be some weird things happening under the hood. If it's working, I tend to forget about it. Um, and I really need some, somebody or some platform to, to kind of nag me and say, Hey, you didn't do X, Y, and Z, and you're going to end up shooting yourself in the foot if you don't do this stuff. Well, yeah. and and so sorry, real quick, Friel, before you jump in, the uh, a, a couple of different things. Like one, somebody commented in the public chat, "Are you using the vertical scaler?" And I think part of what Andy's getting at is there is a vertical pod auto scaler, and nobody uses it. Nobody knows how to use it. That's that's part of why Fairwinds uh, wrote Goldilocks, so one of our open source projects that exposes those resource requests and limits and and what those things should be set at. Uh, exists for this reason because people aren't using the vertical pod auto scaler and you can be. Um, but uh, also I want to go back to something Robert said, which is that um, Kubernetes lets you do a lot of things that are, are messed up. And, and I like to say that Kubernetes is the closest thing we have to a framework for building infrastructure as code anywhere in a cloud, in a data center, whatever. But but really a framework, you know, I would think of as like a foundation. And I like to say that Kubernetes is really somebody giving you some bags of cement and some rebar and saying, good luck, buddy. And you know what? Kubernetes will let you build that foundation without that rebar. If you don't want it, it'll just let you, you know, and, and you're going to have problems if you build that foundation without any rebar. And uh, I recognize I'm giving a very obscure and increasingly deep reference. But, but anyway, uh, Friel, what were you going to say? Yeah, uh, I guess, you know, to, to toil on that metaphor a little further. Yeah, it does give you the, the frames, the two by fours, everything to build your your house. Um, it's up to you to decide whether or not you're going to install a bathroom, right? And <laughs> um, what I would say, though, is, you know, kind of more in defense of actually Kubernetes is, you know, I think Andy and Robert brought up uh, fantastic points about where you can go wrong. For me, looking at the projects that are out there, and I'm sure everyone here, uh, or, or maybe not everyone in the chat uh, watching, has seen this, the the uh, cloud native computing foundations, like giant, uh, very scary chart of all the things that are out there. Um, and I, what I would caution to folks is, uh, you know, Kubernetes is in a much healthier place than it was a few years ago. Um, when you're talking about those uh, CNI plugins, like Kendall mentioned, Weave and Calico and others, they're in such a healthier place now. Um, there's been a real push for stability. Um, when Kubernetes v1s an API or a resource, they like really mean it. They really mean that they've battle tested it and it's extremely uh, well vetted. Um, so yeah, this I'm is <laughs> this up to, to show yeah just how impressive this can be. It is. I mean, this uh, has been a, a full employment program, really, for uh, people in the the distributed system space, um, but. I, you know, I think I apply the same heuristics when looking at what tools are out there as when I say I'm doing full stack development and I'm looking at what open source projects, you know, you reach for, if you're on Node, this might be obscure for some folks who aren't involved in full stack development, but you know, if you're on Node, Express is like your go-to web server. Uh, it has a million stars on GitHub. It's well supported. The version number hasn't changed recently. Um, for the CNCF, you look at what stage of their uh, graduation cycle a project is in. You know, I think they have sandbox, incubation, graduated, um, and you look at those and you decide where to invest your your time and resources in. And I think that's really uh, led me in a good path for choosing the right tools, at least to deploy on top of Kubernetes. So, so it sounds like I mean. Uh, and, and Robert, <laughs> you, you, you work on a product specifically to help guide some of the guardrails around this. And that's, you know, like, like some of what, what we're all saying is some of the biggest issues we've seen are just like misconfiguration, first of all. 
uh, not adding on something that is kind of essential to add on, you know, a la you can build a building without a roof, but at some point it's nice to, you know, not have the water leak through. Um, and uh, uh, Aaron, I really like your, you know, well, we built an entire house and, you know, I, I picture a family moving in and on night one going, wait a second, there's no bathroom. Um, and that could be a problem, right? And it's, and it's a, a lot harder to tack on afterwards. Uh, that, you know, and, and building an outhouse is not going to be the same experience. So, um, I mean, the, the analogy just keeps going and, and I, I get a kick out of that. But um, so let me ask the, the next question. How much do you expose to the developers at your organization? Um, and Freel, let's start with you this time. Um, do they have complete access to all things Kubernetes? How do they actually interact with it? Is it purely through, you know, GitOps somehow, or what's 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 happening for your engineers? Yeah, I mean, we're in a regulated space, so yeah, we're not cowboy, kubectl, uh, you know, doing everything. Um, yeah, we're using a CI/CD pipeline. We make merge requests. We uh, you know, review each other's code. Uh, we use a deployment tool called Pulumi. Uh, we previously used a tool called Helm uh, to collect, you know, collections of these uh, YAML files and hopefully uh, move away from what many in the space call YAML hell um, and move towards, you know, more sensible sort of coding practices. Um, from there, though, we really trust our engineers, and it's not just the DevOps engineers that are making contributions and changing our infrastructure when it comes to connecting to a new vendor or third-party service. Um, we empower each engineer on the team to be able to, to do that and take that on themselves. Yeah, I think um, I think that's been the big story around Kubernetes and DevOps is this idea of shifting more of that burden leftward towards the developer. Um, you know, in the in the bad old days, uh, I've heard one SRE describe it as uh, throwing dead cats over the wall. You know, engineers would just ship their source code. They wouldn't think about what the memory uh, profile is going to be like, what the CPU is going to be like. They would just ship their source code and it would be up to the SRE team to make sure it runs. Um, and they'd run it and, you know, there was a memory leak and everything would fall over. Um, I think making it so that um, like our team... I think I described this a little bit earlier, but the SREs are, are responsible for all the underlying infrastructure, certificate management, ingress, all the stuff that the development team doesn't really need to know about, but the stuff that's that's relevant to the application, the stuff that requires some knowledge about how the application runs, what its resource profile is like, how to tell if it's alive and healthy, that we're all responsible for. So we decide how much memory and CPU the application is going to use. We decide how it's going to scale up and down. And I think that's really helped um, because you know we, we have that context. We know when something's changing that may increase the memory profile, for instance. Um, and it, um, you know, it, it forces us to think about those things rather than just throwing those cats over the wall. Andy, I mean, how do, how do you think about that, across, especially in our service organization, when we have lots and lots of different kinds of organizations? And, uh, you know, how much are we exposing to people versus uh, depending on someone on their side to keep something secret and expose the right amount? And, you know, what does that look like? I mean, Robert described the relationship pretty well, um, seeing as he's effectively a customer of, of ours. Um, but, you know, we have we are usually fortunate enough to have, you know, a DevOps team or person that we correspond to on the other side. So really, like their DevOps team doesn't have to worry about the cluster and the node scaling up. They can ask us or make pull requests into the infrastructure repo to make changes like that. But they don't have to worry about that piece. And then they get to decide what their developers have access to and whatnot. And we don't actually need to control that at all. Um, in most cases, I would say, you know, developers are always empowered to do things with their deployments the way they're, you know, you know, like Robert said, adjusting their resource requests and limits and their HPA settings and things like that. Um, and then, you know, given read access to inspect things in the cluster and view them. Um, but um, yeah. I think I answered your question. No, that's good. So um, let's let's shift here now a little bit towards talking about one one kind of configuration specifically. Uh, there's been a lot of news recently around uh, one particular cloud provider that shall remain named Microsoft uh, and some big security problems that they've had um, lately. And I mean, it's it, there's always like ransomware this, ransomware that, and people are people are getting into things and hacking things and. Uh, Friel, you you live in a particularly regulated environment in a HIPAA environment. Um, let's start there, but talk about how do you think about security? What are the kinds of things you're doing to put the security guardrails in place, both for your team and for the external things to 
to least access all of the stuff. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, those sort of things, supply chain vulnerabilities and um, sort of those, uh, I think there's an XKCD comic about the the pillar uh, that all of open source lives on is like some Git repo, you know, that has maybe a couple contributors <laughs> on it. That's like the underpinning of, of maybe civilization. <laughs> and uh, that's the sort of stuff that keeps me awake at night. Um, but I think that um, in many ways, adopting sort of like that beyond corp zero trust model and then enforcing it at the Kubernetes level uh, really helps uh, quell my fears. Um, so at our organization, we use uh, ingress and egress uh, policies using the network policies in Kubernetes to ensure that um, each deployed resource, whether it's a third party resource like cert manager uh, we described earlier or anything else in our cluster, um, we've vetted what it's talking to and uh, you know, how that interpod uh, communication works as well as to third party uh, resources. Um, and I think that uh, that gives me more confidence. I think that tools, I mean, there's a, there's a plethora of those service mesh tools out there. Um, we've explored a couple of those like Istio um, and uh, they, they, I think try to give you more of that confidence about being able to measure uh, what's going on in your, in your environment. Um, and also to then, be proactive about determining the the data flows, and that's really how I think about it. And and are there any specific third party tools you're using for security, in addition uh, to you know so the, the, some of what you've talked about? But is there do you have yeah. a security overview something that you use? Yeah, we have a review process internally for all of our uh, shipped code, of course, but also um, we rely a little bit on Google Cloud. That's the we're using Google Kubernetes engine for uh, really the maintenance of Kubernetes. We don't try to uh, do Kubernetes the hard way um, and try to manage it ourselves. Um, we've delegated that to a trusted provider in that space. Um, yeah, uh, and I think you know looking at. Azure and AWS, I think they're both uh, really keenly looking at, you know, what is Google doing right in that space uh, as well to try and replicate it with their own Kubernetes systems. Great. And before we move on from that, Friel, uh, we did have a question come in that's that's relevant and you, you talked a little bit about this, but just see if there's anything else you'd say, but it says, what are the guardrails you're using around ingress controllers, for example, on Azure using Azure native load balancers as opposed to Istio or Nginx? Uh, do you have anything else that you'd add? It sounds like you maybe already addressed that, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, yeah. So for for us, we use the uh, the Nginx uh, Ingress controller. Uh, that's a pretty battle tested platform. Um, I think that we're looking at possibly using Istios, which I think is based on the Envoy proxy. Um, that's primarily developed by Lyft, or now it's become its own kind of open source uh, creation. Um, so I think that's where we're looking at for how we are managing data coming into our cluster. Great. Um, Robert, a Andy, you want to talk about security posture stuff? Yeah, I can talk a bit about what we do to, um, you know, put guardrails around our, uh, our own environments. Uh, so we, we really see three checkpoints in the development and deployment process. Um, uh, at the kind of beginning of the process, we have a CICD set of checks that we run. We scan all of our containers as part of the CICD process. Um, we scan our Kubernetes configuration to make sure, you know, people aren't trying to run containers as root and things like that. Um, and then uh, once once we're happy with the, the way things look in the infrastructure as code side of things, um, that gets merged and deployed into the cluster. And then at admission time, we have an admission controller, which basically looks to see um, you know, as, as kind of a, a second um, layer of security to make sure that if something kind of got forced through the CICD process or if somebody circumvented the CICD process, say, doing a kubec to apply to try and get something into the cluster without the infrastructure as code, the admission controller uh, serves as a, as a way to kind of stop those things before they get into the cluster. I like to think of it as like a bouncer for your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so we block things there. And then um, because there are certain things that, um, you know, maybe we need to um, allow into the cluster at a point in time, but we want to keep eyes on it uh, over time, um, or maybe there are vulnerabilities in some of the third party stuff that we're using. Um, we have an in-cluster scanner. So we're constantly looking at all the resources that are in the cluster and seeing, do they conform to our policy? Are there vulnerable Docker images? Um, are there things that are running as root that shouldn't be, things like that. Um, so we really have three different layers of security to make sure that we're, we're constantly on top of security things. 
Sounds good. Andy, you have anything to add to that? Um, I, you know, the biggest thing from the managed service side for us is really managing um, CVEs, just keeping track of, you know, what version of Kubernetes are we on? What CVEs are out there for it? Like the one that just came through last night um, and uh, making sure that we get those patched as quickly as possible and prioritizing those as needed across the different tools that we use. And, uh, you know, we use some of the same tools that Robert was talking about to do that. Um, you know, we're using Trivi within Insights to keep track of, of tools running in the cluster and then, you know, just keeping on top of notification lists and things like that for Kubernetes level stuff. Excellent. Okay, good. Well, so uh, we had a couple questions that came through, but I want to I pivot over and give a brief uh, demo of insights, which I will do, and then we will come back and answer some of those questions. So if you have other questions, please uh, keep asking them. Um, there is a Q&A thing. Um, I'm seeing some questions come through chat and some questions come through Q&A. So if you can put the questions in the Q&A, it's a little easier for me to triage. Uh, but um, let me share my screen again here. So, so the reason we're having this webinar, the reason we're talking about this topic is uh, Fairwinds builds software for guardrails in Kubernetes, uh, that configuration validation platform where, where Datadog is going to tell you if your house is on fire, Fairwinds Insights exists to say, hey, you built a foundation without rebar. Hey, you built a house and you forgot a bathroom. Hey, maybe you should put a roof on that. Uh, also, don't let that guy in. He looks sketchy, right? Things like that. Um, so uh, that's where Fairwinds Insights sits. Um, when you log into um, Insights, you will get a page that looks like this. Uh, let's see if I make my window a little bit bigger here. Um, so I have an organization view with a number of different clusters running. Um, we're tracking trends over time in these clusters. This cluster is very uninteresting in that it's staying right around the same health score. We give a big overall health score. Uh, this organization gets a B. And, it, and we're, we're breaking down a number of different things that we're checking for into different levels of severity, critical, high, medium, low, none. Uh, we also have um, the top issues that we're seeing across your organization. So, you know, if, if you have one or two clusters, this is maybe less relevant. If you're one of those organizations running 30 clusters or 100 clusters, knowing, hey, one thing we're really bad at is the image pull policy should be always, you know, something like that. And you can click on this. It's going to show you what the issue is. Where, where that's being found, uh, what namespace, et cetera. But um, before I dive into that, I'm gonna click through into a cluster here and I'm gonna show you, you know, here's here's a cluster running. We will show you how action items are introduced over time. Again, this is, I, I have other clusters that have more exciting action item int introductions. Uh, an overview of how this cluster is doing. So this cluster has an A minus score. Um, we track that health score over time. Uh, we also have some cost analysis. This one is very boring. I, I, I need to switch organizations just to, to, to make that prettier, but it's okay. I'm going to keep going. Um, a lot of the bulk of the information is here in these in this list of action items. And so we're breaking down, like as I, as I mentioned, a whole bunch of different things, uh, covering the categories of security, reliability, and efficiency. And we break that into five different levels of severity. So you can see here, you know, it's, it's very common for the critical issues to be security related. Uh, and you can click onto any one of these things and it'll tell you both what's going on as well as how to go about fixing it. So it includes that remediation step, which is significant. Now you can scroll across here and uh, assign this issue to somebody. You can say uh, it's working as intended or we don't have any intention of fixing it. You can also create a ticket and click that out, uh, kick that out to another system. If you're integrating with something like Jira, we do have Jira integration built in. Um, and where we're getting all this, you can see this says KubeBench here. This is OPA. We've got a number of different things running. Trivi, we've got Goldilocks down here. So I'll go over to the report hub. These, this is where we're pulling all of these reports. So as I mentioned, Fairwinds has built a lot of open source in this space. Uh, you can see Polaris is here. That's, this is a tool that we wrote that sort of began this journey for us that checks for common configuration validation things, just things we see people mess up all the time that we know this is low hanging fruit. Uh, you should avoid these problems. So that's what Polaris does. Now, we also integrate with Nova that looks for out-of-date Helm, uh, Helm charts. We have Pluto that looks for deprecated APIs. That's not on this list. Um, Goldilocks uh, gets your resource requests and limits right. We've touched on that. A couple of people have asked about cost stuff, and uh, I'll get into that in a second. But um, now we also integrate with Trivi, and we also have KubeSec, KubeBench, KubeHunter, uh, and then um, also support for OPA, so or OPA. 
Uh, I was actually corrected by someone who told me it is not OPA, it is OPA, and you need to pronounce it right. Uh, and if you go to their website, it will tell you it's OPA, not OPA. Anyways, so uh, you can write your own custom policy. So if you are if you need a check that we are not checking for out of the box uh, in Insights, you can do that um, with, with OPA. Now, I showed you that big long list of action items of things that need to get knocked out. If you're an ops leader and you plug this into 15 clusters and you have this incredible long list of all the things you need to go knock out, it can be overwhelming uh, and it can feel like it's all on you. And so we've tried to push a lot of that responsibility left into, uh, the, res into the hands of the developer. Also, we don't wanna wait until things are broken and running in production before we realize they're broken and fix them. So we have integration at the CI level. Um, Robert mentioned we also stop things at the admission controller level, which anything that we check for in CI, you can set to also check at the admission controller level. Um, but here, Robert, uh, being the developer that he is, uh, trying to set an example, I guess, um, is running a container as root and adding insecure permissions to the container. It occurs to me that I give this demo a lot, but uh, it's seldom that Robert, who issued this pull request, is on the call with me while I'm uh, making comments about it. So I'm pretty sure um, he sent me that exact pull request last week. That's, <laughs> that's right. Um, and so you can see here, CircleCI has run tests and it has passed, but Fairwinds Insights has found five new action items and uh, has failed it. Now, you can click on details here and it's going to load you right into the UI and it's gonna say, hey, here's the critical issues that kept this from being deployed. Now, it depends on what you're setting for the threshold. You can say high and above, we don't want to deploy. You can say critical and above, we don't want to deploy. Um, but uh, then the engineer can click on this and say, oh, I need to go and, and change this in my workload configuration, and then I'm gonna be able to deploy what I'm building. So if you have a very large organization, if service ownership is something you've actually moved towards, the ability to be able to go in and, and actually change these things um, is significant. So there's a couple other pieces I want to show you here. Um, let's drop into the workloads view. Uh, and let's see, I think I have a more interesting cluster here. Um, I don't know, it, which which one's the most interesting cluster, Robert? Is it SIG test or testing one, two, three? No, no, that one's not it. I think I have one cluster that has a lot more information, but uh, maybe I can't find it here in the workloads. Well, it's okay. So. Um, you can see, first of all, we're breaking down relative total cost uh, of the, the all the different workloads in this cluster. And we're showing you, you know, the Hello Kubernetes app here is using the vast majority of the resources. Um, and then uh, you can see here that the resource requests and limits are set such that this is costing you almost $50 a month. If you take our recommendations, it's going to go down to $3 per month, saving you $46 a month. Now, this is a small test environment that only has three pods running. Um, if you have an environment running hundreds and hundreds of pods, obviously the savings can be quite a bit more significant. Or if for some reason you were wildly over-provisioned or under-provisioned. Now we'll also, if you click into this, tell you sometimes uh, to increase your resource request limits and, and it will actually increase your costs. So just so you know, we're going to give recommendations based on... Uh, a number of different things there that, that we're collecting over time. We're, we're watching the cluster over time, we're watching the usage over time, and we're giving you recommendations based off of some averages therein. Uh, and so um, there are gonna be times where we suggest that you actually increase what you have. Uh, let's see, what else do I wanna show? I'm, I'm normally in a different organization, so I'm gonna switch over to that to, to show a, a slightly different version of this. So, um, and go. Proximapod. Okay, so we also have, uh, well, here's the workloads thing that I was just showing. So this is checking for out-of-date add-ons. So to, you know, um, Friel's point earlier on, just staying on top of all the different add-ons that you gotta have, uh, because there are additional things in addition to Kubernetes that you need, and we wanna know when those things become deprecated. We wanna know when those things are out of date and need to be updated. And so here's just a clear view into all the things that you have running what needs to be updated, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot more here. We have uh, automation to kick things out to uh, um, different places. You can plug this into your repositories and you get feedback based on just what's in your code. Uh, there's a lot more in Insights. I'm really just interested in whetting your appetite today. 
uh, rather than showing you the entire platform. But if you are interested in seeing any more about this, get in touch with Fairwinds. We're happy to show you. And, and we have a free demo and a proof of value process that we can walk through to see how insights might be relevant to your organization. So if you're using Kubernetes and you're using it at any kind of scale and you want to be sure that you're doing things right, uh, that's where Insights sits. Is it's configuration validation. It's going to give you that confidence that you have built things the way that you should build things. Because if five years from now you find out that it really would have been nice to have rebar in your foundation, it's it's uh, a lot more painful to add in later on than it is to catch early and solve. So that's Fairwinds Insights. Thanks for sticking with me through that. Uh, let's answer this polling question, and I will launch that, and then we will get over to our Q and A. Start pulling. Here we go. What is the greatest opportunity to improve your Kubernetes environment? Uh, getting help with the basics, general best practice assessment, improving the security posture of your clusters, saving money, improving the reliability of apps running in Kubernetes. And let's spend a minute here responding to that. I'm disappointed and that none of these responses has rebar in it. I'm just putting that out there. Or a bathroom or a roof. Or a roof. I'm also seeing that uh, Andy messaged me in the background and said that uh, apparently I said helm charks, which uh, I don't remember saying in that demo, but I'm sure was very, very relevant. Uh, Andy plays the role at our organization of calling me out on when I make mistakes, which uh, is actually his full time job because it requires quite a bit of attention. Yeah, this uh, Kubernetes stuff's just on the side. Uh, just, just on the side. Okay, we've got a bunch of responses coming in. I'll give it about 10 more seconds. Y'all are being a lot more responsive to this one, maybe because everyone was still learning Kubernetes and was afraid to respond to such uh, to the first question. And we'll get over to Q&A. And five, four, three, click a button now or forever hold your peace. Um, close poll. Okay, and results from that, 18% saying getting help with the basics. 26 saying general best practices assessment. Another 26 saying improve the security posture of my clusters. Only 9% of you care about saving money, or at least said that that's the greatest opportunity. Um, and 21% said improving the reliability of apps running in Kubernetes. So um, thanks for sharing. That's, that's interesting data for the rest of y'all, but... Um, Let's, I'm gonna leave this up for a minute. If you, if you want some best practices, go check this out. Uh, I'm gonna leave this on your screen for a minute so you can type in that link if you need and let's dive into some Q and A. So let's see here. Wow, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of questions here. Um, any thoughts on Argo CD? And we'll start with that. Don't everyone volunteer at once. I don't think, uh... We've really used Argo or, or Flux or any of those um, application deployment uh, models before, at least at Fairwinds. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in them personally, but um, honestly, our, you know, just sending off a Helm chart uh, via Circle CI or whatever your CI provider is seems to be a pretty solid method for us. Um, it seems to be the kind of the simplest, and um, I'm a little worried about the complexity of Argo CD if we were to try to adopt it. But uh, again, I don't have any experience with it in production. I don't have any experience with it in production, but um, you know the evaluation that I did on Argo CD previously, I had a, a somewhat of a philosophical disagreement with Argo CD in that they wanted the application code and the you know Helm chart or the MIAML manifest that deploy that code to live in different repositories. And from the conversations that we've had earlier, I think we've all had great success with allowing developers to manage and maintain their charts or their deployment code or whatever it is right next to their application as part of their application. And so that fundamental kind of disagreement of philosophy really didn't sit well with me initially, but I don't have any production screens either. Uh, yeah, I have not uh, deployed Argo or played with it, but I would agree um, with what you just said about separating the, the code and the infrastructure. Um, one of the worst things you can do when uh, talking about best practices is you roll out some new infrastructure and some code simultaneously, and then you revert one, but not the other. It's incredibly easy to do when you're running separate repos for each. Um, and uh, it will ruin your day when you have a new application using an old config or vice versa. Um, it's not going to be a good day. <laughs> this actually Great. plays into one of the other questions we have, Kendall. 
Um, the, if you just want me to read it, the other question is what about the operating model when it comes to enterprise, for example, who writes helm charts for deployment, uh, developers or ops, where do SREs come into the picture? Who builds the cluster? And I think, you know, my statement to that would be, um, developers should be writing their own Elm charts. You know, uh, it is the SREs um, role to build infrastructure that enables developers to do the things they need to do. So we talked about things like external DNS and cert manager, which are infrastructure pieces that our SRE teams manage, but then the developers write the actual ingress objects that make use of those other tools and are have the configuration that's pertinent to their application and how it should be deployed. And I think that model works really well for a large number of, you know, small to large companies um, across the board. Yeah, I think the way to think about it is that the ops team should be able to build infrastructure that can be used across many different development teams in many different ways without having to know too much about what those specific development teams are doing. There's always going to be some conversation between the development team and the ops team when things go wrong. Uh, but generally speaking, the ops team should be focused on all the undifferentiated stuff and the development team should be focused on um, you know, things that are specific to their application. Nothing down there. I agree with all that. <laughs> Nothing out of there. And Andy, can you mark that one as answered? I'm not seeing that question. I want to make sure I, I don't uh, revisit twice. So you hit publish and then uh, come back to that. Um, okay, let's see. How do you address the zero touch approach in securing services and apps? And how or will that replace the guardrail and governance needs? Um, so, well, I have a thought on this, but uh, anybody want to answer first? I to be clear, the, the word is zero <laughs> trust, not zero touch. That's, uh, I said zero touch. Oh, man, I'm having a hard time yeah. today. Uh, I think since I, I opined on zero trust first here, I'll hop in. And I say, yeah, they're, I think they're complementary approaches, right? I think that running something like OPA, which I just learned how it's pronounced today, uh, running something like OPA and doing continuous monitoring, um, that is more you know, sort of on the, the op side. And I think that building zero trust in from the beginning, that's more on the dev side. And you know that glorious union of the two, DevOps, um, is meeting in the middle and then having a little bit of both. But you need to do that continuous monitoring of compliance. Of course, that's a big word in the field that I'm in. And also making sure that you're building good security practices in and baking them in from the start. Great. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would argue like zero trust is important. Zero trust is a significant, if you build zero trust in a lot of places that re dramatically reduces the problems that you're going to have, but you're going to still need guardrails. You're going to still need governance to continue to enforce that over time. But also like there's going to be pieces, whether there's zero trust or not, like there's, there's, there's an application that, that, uh, uh, is going to have problems introduced or, or CDs that are going to come out or, you know, and granted with, with the least amount of trust, it's very few things are actually zero trust. Uh, some things need access to something or they're probably not going to be running in your cluster. Minimal trust is great. But, uh, zero trust, but verify. Zero, zero trust, but verify. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, let's see. Uh, I answered that. I'm confused by some of where some of these are moving here. Um, how about uh, what are one or two of the most common cost controlling best practices? I'm gonna ha who wants to start with that one? Set your resource requests and limits properly. I'm, I'm going to beat that drum until yeah. Kubernetes is no longer a thing. But yeah. 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 And to expand on that, like you really need to not only set them once, but monitor them over time. You know, make sure that if your application maybe has gotten a little bit more CPU and memory intensive, maybe you need to uh, raise them up a bit. Um, or maybe if, it, if you've gotten more efficient over time, uh, maybe you can lower them down a bit and save some money. Um, it's, uh, it's really something that needs to be continuously tuned rather than just set and forget. Okay, and uh, let's do one more and then we'll turn it back over to the devops.com folks to wrap us up and do the drawing here at the end. But uh, this question just came in. How do you address runtime security within the cluster, which is not tackled by network policies and repo scanning? That's an excellent question. Yeah, um, I think that that's where you look into tools like uh, Istio, um, having some sort of managed identity for your workloads, um, for them to communicate with each other securely. Uh, having, I think that 
the uh, there's a problem in security called the confused sheriff or the confused deputy. Uh, common security vulnerability where you have some sort of uh, deputy that's able to do privileged actions, you know, modify customer data or whatever the case may be. Um, and it gets confused because it's a lot, it's too permissive about what types of requests it's allowed to receive. And so uh, that is sort of your privilege escalation vector. Um, being conscious about what talks to what and when, and you know, being really close to your application developer teams in you know what needs to have this sort of privilege and credential is you know I think ultimately runtime security goes down into application development and making sure that you're conscious about those sort of decisions, um, and that space is I think ripe for innovation too as well. There's standards like Spiffy uh, out there for identity and workload verification as well. Great. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I mean, it, I, Robert, Andy, nothing to add. Otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, yeah. I think that was pretty well said. Okay. Yeah, well, great. thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you, Freel, for joining us. And um, we hope to see some of you reach out and, uh, you know, want to use the things that we showed you. I uh, want to talk more about it or, or at least, you know, look up some of our open source. It's probably relevant to you. And um, thanks so much to everyone. And I will turn it back over to Julio uh, to jump in and do the drawing here. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, today's webinar has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, you will be able to watch it again. We'll be sending an email with a link to access the webinar on demand. Uh, the webinar will also be available on uh, containerjournal.com slash webinars. Look in the on-demand section um, webinars page and it should be there. Uh, and now for the Amazon gift card winners. Our first winner is uh, Jen J. Congratulations, congratulations, Jen. Our second winner is Kevin C. Our third winner is Duncan L. And our final winner is Kelly B. So congratulations to all our winners. We'll be reaching out to you via email with instructions for claiming your gift card. So please check your inbox. If you don't see it there, check your spam folder. Again, uh, thanks to uh, Kendall, Andy, Robert, and Aaron for an excellent webinar. And thanks again to the audience for joining. I'm Julio Godinez signing off. Until next time, be well.